So let's go ahead and get started talking about teaching with Guru with Zinnia Shi and Hannah Graham. I'm Kim Case and I'm pleased to have my co-host Peggy George and Lorna Costatini today. And we have Tammy Moore who's uh, so faithful in doing our closed captioning each week. Thank you so much. And to Lori who helped moderate the chat and post the questions to our special guests. And this week we're going to be, again, we're going to be talking about the Guru Search Engine. This is our Live Binder and we share all of the resources through the Live Binder. And Peggy's going to post that link. There you go. And you can access that after the session. All of the links that are shared um, during the session are also added to the Live Binder as well as the links that Zinnia and Hannah have shared with us prior to have are included in the live binder currently. We do record each of our sessions and when they are posted to a blog post on our archives and resources page on our website. So be sure to check that out for all of the past archives um, at any time that you have a chance or if you miss our live session. And right now we're going to be uh, using the world map and the laser pointer tool. And the laser pointer tool is the second one in the list. If you'll click on it and then click again to get the little starburst and then put where you're located in the world on the world map. We always love to see where everybody's joining us from today. And I think I saw some from Argentina, down in South America. Uh, over in um, Europe and lots of places near Asia and China. Regardless of where you are, you can type it in the chat if you're unable to uh, get the Starburst to work. But we are so glad that you've joined us on this Saturday. So now let's go ahead and head over to our polling questions. And you'll vote just below your name with the little hand with the, with the little check mark. And have you used Guru? If you have, please click on the green check. And if you've not, click on the red X. And I'll give everybody just a few more seconds to find the way to vote. You kind of hover over it and then select your option. Yes, if you've used Guru is the green check. No is the red X. And let me go ahead and post those results. And we'll get an idea. And I posted it and didn't show it. Let me try again. Okay, I'm not seeing the results come up, but it looks like we have an overwhelming majority of the no's that have not used Guru yet. There it is, finally showed up. Thank you. Um, and it looks like only about 16% in the group have used Guru before. So let me clear the results. We'll go on to the next polling question. And we're going to change our polling options because we have a few more options to choose from. And for today's presentation, are you more interested in getting a basic introduction to Guru or more interested in learning specific about ways to use Guru for your teaching needs in your classroom or C, both, learning how to use it and how you would use it to teach? So if you could click on the A, B, or C and register your vote, that would be great. I'll give everybody a little bit more time. And hopefully this time the results will publish. There we go, and it's a pretty overwhelming majority about C. Uh, 
ways that we can use it in our teaching, use Guru in our teaching, as well as how to use Guru. So that's going to be information for our presenters. So let me clear the results, and we will go to our next polling question. And let me change the options right back. And do you have a Guru account? Green check for yes. Red X for no, just below your name. And let me get those results for us. Not sure why it's taking a while for them to show up, but that's okay. We're going to keep right on going. And it looks like 21 of us, there it is, thank you, about 11% do not, or 61% do not have the an Guru account, and about 11% do. And I'm sure it's going to change once our session is complete. And I would love to welcome our two special guests today, Zinnia Shi and Hannah Grimm. They're going to be talking with us about teaching with Guru. And uh, this is going to be a very um, exciting session on using this search engine. And Zinnia coordinates community and partner outreaches for Guru, which is the free search engine. And it was developed by a nonprofit organization whose mission is to honor the human right to education. And she's a marketing and social media specialist who is very passionate about working with nonprofit organizations and particularly education nonprofits. She does have a teaching background and has tutored, mentored, and coached many youths as she was inspired to work in education with the numerous teachers she encountered. Hannah Grimm is also with her, and she is a science teacher. And she teaches at Prospect Sierra Middle School in El Cerrito, California. And so we are so grateful to have these two special guests today talking with us about teaching with Guru. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to them, the newbie questions. What is a search engine for learning? So welcome, Zinni and Hannah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm really excited to speak with you all about Guru. And I'm, as I wrote in the chat, I'm really excited that um, most people chose C, uh, wanting to learn about both things, because I will be covering both in basic introduction to Guru and also um, more about how you can use Guru in your classroom within this session. So to answer the newbie question, I'm going to just go ahead and jump right into some background about Guru and what we do. So Guru is a free search engine for learning, and it helps teachers quickly and easily discover, organize, and also teach topic relevant and standards aligned learning resources. So to give you some background, Guru was actually just founded in January 2011, uh, so not too long ago, by Prasad Ram, who likes to go by Prom. So Prom's inspiration for Guru originated from the frustration that he kept experiencing as he spent hours and hours scouring the web to help his fourth grade daughter find learning materials and resources that were actually relevant for her age and relevant to the topic that she was studying. And he had this intuition that teachers and students around the world were also experiencing similar frustrations. And once he was able to validate this, he actually began developing a web-based prototype of a search engine for learning. Now, Prom worked on this prototype as his 20% project at Google, where he was formerly the director of engineering in the research department. So he has a great deal of knowledge about search engines. Um, and eventually, his project actually evolved into a year-long pilot program. And this involved 1,000 students across 25 classrooms in North India. And because it was so successful, he actually left Google and founded Guru as a nonprofit education technology organization in January 2011. So we are a 501c3 nonprofit, and we're based in usually sunny Palo Alto, California, although it's a little overcast this morning. Um, and as uh, Kim mentioned before, our mission is to honor the human right to education. 
Our website is www.gurulearning.org. So if you haven't visited us before, please make sure you do so after this session and check it out. Um, and one thing I do want to quickly clarify, because I know it's usually a bit confusing for um, new users, is that our name is Guru, not Guru Learning. And um, the only reason that gurulearning.org is our URL is because that when we were founded, someone had actually already taken the URL guru.org. So just to clarify that little uh, confusing bit. All right, so now you're probably wondering what you can do with Guru and what makes it a valuable tool for you as a teacher. Um, in a bit, I'm actually going to share my screen with you and show you how to use Guru and give you a quick tour. Uh, but here's a quick overview of its features. So we like to say discover, organize, and teach. So for discover, you can use the Guru search engine to find millions of topic relevant and standards aligned learning resources. And we don't create our own resources, but we do link to free online educational materials from vetted websites like NASA, Khan Academy, IXL, CK12, and on. And currently we cover 5th through 12th grade math, science, history, and economics topics. Uh, but we're actually working on expanding to additional subjects like English language arts and other grades as well. So we will be K through 12. Organize. Um, so what can you do with all of these great resources after you've found them? Using Guru, you can actually organize them into a collection, which is what we call a playlist of resources. And collections are fully customizable, so you can tag them with important information like the academic standard to which they're aligned and also the grade and subject they're intended for. You can also add narration to each resource in your collection. And narration is written instruction that's intended to guide your students. And I'll show you a little more about narration later on in this session. And lastly, teach. So you can teach with Guru by sharing resources and collections with your students. Some teachers like to present their collections in the classroom um, with, a present, uh, with a projector and a computer. And other teachers like to assign them to their students as homework um, so they'll access their teacher's collections at home from their home computer. Uh, one teacher that we work closely with, his name is Jack West, and he teaches in Sequoia High School in California. He actually sets up a guru station in his blended classroom. So that's yet another way of, um, that teachers use guru in their classroom. And towards the end of the webinar, we'll actually hear from Hannah Grimm, who's a middle school science teacher that we were introduced to um, in the beginning of the session. And she will share the ways that she uses Guru. Um, so you can kind of get a peek at what real teachers are doing uh, with our website in their classrooms. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to switch over to a screen share now so that I can show you how to search on Guru. All right, so hopefully you can all see um, my screen now. So let's say I'm a science teacher looking for resources on wind. We're actually going to start on Google, and we'll do a quick search. And I imagine this is how many students um, start searching for resources, maybe some teachers as well. So a regular search engine gives me, as you'll see here, millions and millions and millions of search results in just a fraction of a second. Um, but if you take a closer look at these results, you'll see that although we do have a wind map here, we also have uh, a mobile company weather forecast for San Jose, since I'm located near San Jose, a symphony, and a radio station. And let's go over to Guru and do the same search. So wind turbines, uh, wind power, seed dispersal by winds, and these are much more in line with the search results that I intended to find. And so Guru has nine types of resources. If you scroll down, you can see them all. If you hover your mouse over one of the search results, you can see important information like a description of the resource, um, the academic standards to which it's aligned. So this would be the California Science Curriculum Standards. And you can also see which collections it's used in. And as I mentioned before, a collection is a playlist of resources. 
Um, I can also click on this link here, go to original source, and that would take me to the original website that this resource came from, uh, which in this case is Wikimedia. And I can also play a resource by clicking on it. So it looks like here I have a wind map. If I like a resource, I can add it to my shelf by clicking on this button here. And uh, you'll see that I have different folders set up. So a shelf is like basically your personal bookshelf on Guru. Um, so you can store and organize all of your favorite content there. So I'm going to go ahead and add this to my science folder in my shelf. And exit out of this resource preview. We scroll back up to the top. I just want to show you that you can also search for collections. Um, so right now we're in resources. If I go ahead and click on collections, I'll get my search results. And by hovering my mouse over a collection, I can preview all of its resources to the right. So here is a collection called Winds um, by a teacher named Amber Schultz. And then to the right, here are all of the resources in that collection. And the same goes for Wind Power. So I'm going to say I like this uh, Winds collection. So like resources, I can add this collection to my shelf simply by clicking on this Add button. We'll click on Science. And once I've done that, I can navigate over to my shelf and see it in the folder I've saved it in. So to get to Shelf, you go up to this top drawer and you click on the Shelf button. So my default folder is actually my favorites. Um, but I'll just navigate over to Science and we'll see this Wind Collection that I just added. When I click on this little gray arrow here, I have different options. Um, so I can either study the collection, I can customize it, I can move it to a different folder on my shelf if I've misplaced it, or I can remove it. So I want to focus on customizing today. Um, and this brings us actually into the section of the webinar where I show you how you can utilize Guru um, as a teaching tool for your classroom. And this is a feature that teachers have told us they really love about Guru, uh, the customization aspect. So I go ahead and click on Customize. I can rename it. And let's see. Yep, here we go. And now we are in what we call edit mode. So here is general information about my collection. And then below here, I see all of the resources that are in that collection. So basically, um, just to give you a little refresher, what happened just now is that I found a collection I liked. And then I made a copy of it, my own personal copy, that I can now customize. So I can, you know, if there were just a few resources that I didn't like in the original collection, I can go ahead and delete them, get rid of them. And I can also add my own resources. Um, but we're going to start with editing the general information that we see up here. So I will click on this pencil icon here, which is um, an edit button. And this allows me to edit basic information about the collection. So for example, the learning objectives, um, the grades that it's intended for, and also the course that it should be classified under. So here it's actually under Earth Science. If I wanted to add another classification, I could do that by clicking here. And I can also add collaborators to my collection. And by default, a collection can only be customized by the person that creates it or makes a copy of it. But if I add another user as a collaborator, um, that person shares editing privileges. So I just type in the Guru username of the person that I want to add. It just happens to be my coworker. Oops, I added her twice. And now she's a collaborator if I go ahead and save that. And then the next time that she logs into Guru, she will actually um, see this collection, my collection, in her shelf, and she will be able to customize it as well, which allows for uh, some really nice collaboration between teachers or between teachers and students, et cetera. I can rearrange resources very easily by dragging and dropping them. So if I want to move this to this section, and then this resource here, I can easily do that. 
And I can also add additional resources to our collection by clicking on Add a Resource. And then I can either upload them from my own computer, so upload file, I can browse my computer, or by pulling it from an educational website. So I have the option to upload it from a URL. And earlier, I actually mentioned narration, uh, which is written instruction that's intended to guide your students through a resource. And I can add narration to a resource by clicking on this thumbnail while I'm in edit mode and typing into the narrative field. So I'll go ahead and click on this one, and you'll see this narrative field here. And click save. And you click on that. So I've just added narration to the second resource in this collection. Once I'm finished editing my collection, I can change its privacy settings so that it's public, which means that it's publicly searchable on Guru. Um, and how I do that is with this icon here, which is the share icon. So you'll see I can make it public, or I can make it public only to the people that I choose to share this link with. So if I've never published, or if you've never published a collection on Guru before, um, selecting public here, we'll send a publishing request to our team. And we actually vet each collection on an individual basis to ensure that it's complete and also appropriate for educational use. And once we've approved it, we'll give you permission to make it completely public. Um, after you've gained initial publishing approval, you'll be able to publish other collections going forward. So I have um, gone through the publishing request uh, before and received permission to publish a collection. So now I can just go ahead and make this collection public. And lastly, what I can do um, now that I've finished editing my collection and making it public is I can play my collections to get the study experience. This is what a collection looks like from play mode. So I just clicked on that play button. Here's the title page. Um, here are the standards to which it's aligned, some related content. And this is a quiz that's related to this collection. Vocabulary, uh, acknowledgments to the different websites that the resources come from, a description here. And then I can also see um, some social information. For example, no one has looked at this collection yet, but this would be how many views it has, subscribers, which means the number of people that have added this collection to their shelves, um, how many people have liked it, and I can actually like my own collection by doing that. And if we click on study, we'll load the first resource. Looks like, unfortunately, this uh, resource is not working right now, but we can easily navigate to the next resource. This right here, what I just opened, is what we call the right drawer. And if you open that when you're playing a collection, um, you get this nice little outline of all of the resources in your collection. So you actually don't have to study it in order. You can scroll and click on a different resource to skip directly to that. Or you can use this navigation at the bottom to get to the next resource. And if you recall, this is the resource that I actually added narration to. And so how I enable that narration is this little box here. I click on that and see what I typed. And this just allows um, you to guide your students through a resource if they're looking at an interactive um, resource and they're not sure how to go about using it. You can give them instructions in this narration box. All right, so that was a very quick, basic introduction to um, Guru, the search engine for learning. And I also just want to quickly mention that we also have two iPad apps. Um, so I think a couple of you may have mentioned that you have used or downloaded the app. Um, so we have the Guru Collections iPad app. And this is a purely study experience. Um, your students can, or you can download uh, Guru Collections on your iPad and then study collections right from your iPad. So it's a very um, study on the go experience. And uh, one thing I should let you know is that you can't customize collections through this iPad app. Um, it's purely study, as I mentioned before. Um, but if you go to our website, you can check it out, and you can download it for free uh, from the App Store. And then we do also have a slightly newer iPad app called Classbooks. 
Right now it's limited to just U.S. history, but it's a digital textbook experience. Um, and uh, we are looking for history buffs and history teachers and students who love history to help us develop out this app a little more. Um, so please also download this app on your iPad. Um, again, it is free. And uh, play around with it a little bit and let us know what you think. Um, well, your feedback is actually going to help us improve this uh, app. So we would love to hear your feedback on this. All right, so now that I've given you um, a very basic in introduction to Guru and what you can do with Guru, I want to introduce you to Hannah Grimm, who is a science teacher at Prospect Sierra Middle School, uh, to talk about how she uses Guru. So Hannah, I'd like to turn it over to you now. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. Um, so I use Guru in my classroom in a variety of ways. The first and sort of simplest way I use it is just as a search engine. So if I have students who are working on a project and I want them to be looking for useful resources without having to deal with all of the um, excess things that might appear on a Google search, Guru is one way I use it. Um, the sort of next level up that I use it for is as a sort of digital textbook. So my school doesn't have text. And that can be very frustrating for parents who want to follow along with their kids at home. And so if I have a kid whose parents are very involved and who really want to be helping their kids, oftentimes I'll just do a quick search for whatever topic I'm teaching and find a pre-made collection that deals with whatever it is I'm teaching my kids. And I'll send a link to it out home to parents so that they can go through the resources with their kids and help them understand. I and mean, oftentimes that's actually a lot better than having a textbook because there's, you know, activities built in, it's a lot more engaging, the students tend to stay more focused with it, um, and the parents are very grateful to have those resources. Um, so I'll use the, it as a search engine, I'll use it as a sort of digital textbook using the pre-made collection, and then I also used it for projects. Um, so I've done a couple projects that have involved having students build collections about specific uh, topics. So for example, my sixth grade class recently had an astronomy project, and each of them had to choose some sort of heavenly body. A lot of them chose, you know, planets or moons or a particular galaxy, and they were seeking to create a collection designed to teach their classmates about that topic. And so they had to find good resources that were engaging. They wrote narration to explain each resource, and they built collections that they then shared with their peers, and everyone spent a class period looking through their peers' collections and learning about what their friends were interested in. Um, I have also used it to keep in touch with students who had to leave the school. So I've got a kid who is in Germany um, and can't be with us, and so I will send resources to him uh, long distance so that he can study along. Um, and then probably where it is most useful for me is subplans. So if I can't be in the classroom and I have a sub who I'm not entirely certain their particular level of uh, confidence with the material, I will create a collection that covers whatever it is I'm trying to deal with in class that day. And it might involve screencasts that have me actually speaking to the student and walking them through some sort of online resource so that even though I can't be in the classroom every day, they can actually be there with my voice walking them through whatever it is they need to do. So I have used it in a variety of methods. I think it's really wonderful. Um, and I love the attitude they have about it, which is very much one of just trying to help out the teachers. There's never any sense of someone trying to uh, take your money away, which I oftentimes find with other technology and education resources. Um, so I guess that's my usage. What else would you guys like to hear? Great. Thanks so much, Hannah, for sharing. Um, one thing I do want to draw everyone's attention to is the bottom of the slide where I have a link, uh, guruelearning.org slash community slash I'm an educator. And I'm actually going to do go back to another screen share and just show you that page really quickly. Give it a second to load. Um, this is the URL that I have on the bottom of the slide. 
Um, and you can visit it to read more about how other teachers are using Guru. Um, so we have this first tab right here is getting started. So we'll give you three very basic steps to start using Guru if you're brand new to it. And then if you click on teaching with Guru, you'll see how our teacher is using Guru. And um, we have a few use case scenarios. So enrich your presentation, blend your classroom, flip your teaching, let your students explore, etc. And then a few best practices. Um, our featured teacher currently is Paul Allison, who is an English teacher at Bronx Academy Senior High. He's doing some really innovative work with Guru, um, and we love, you know, the stories that he shares about how he's using Guru to collaborate with other teachers and with the students as well. And uh, we were hoping that he could join us today, but he's at a conference in camp. But I just wanted to give him a shout out in this webinar because. Um, we work with him quite frequently, and he's been great. Um, so definitely check out his story. And you can also read about Sue Pound, who assigns Guru um, as homework to her students, and another teacher named Chris, um, who uses Guru in his flipped classroom. And then Jack West, as I mentioned before, has a station rotation. One of the stations is an interactive Guru station. Um, and he also has a blended classroom. So you get a chance, definitely go and check out um, these stories. I think they're very interesting to see the different ways that educators are using Guru. And it's definitely not um, something that has only one use case in a classroom. Um, there are very innovative ways that you can use it and uh, adapt it to your classroom and teaching needs. All right, so before I open up the floor to any questions that you might have, I just wanted to point you to some resources that you might find helpful. Um, so first of all, at the top of the slide, you see um, our teacher community. So I moderate our teacher community on LinkedIn, and I highly encourage you to join by the bit.ly link that we have there on the top left hand of the slide. Uh, the community is an online space for teachers who use Guru to connect and collaborate with other teachers. And there's some really interesting conversations happening in the community. Um, and I'd love to keep in touch with all of you there. Secondly, um, on the bottom half of the slide, you'll see the Guru pilot program. So if you're interested in trying Guru out in your school, we do have this pilot program, uh, which is a free four-week professional development course. And you will work directly with members of the Guru team to master aspects of Guru. So some of the schools we run the program pilot program with include the Chicago Public Schools and also Jordan Middle School, which is here in Palo Alto, California, where we're located. So if you're interested in bringing Guru to your school, um, you can visit the bit.ly link that you see at the bottom of the page. Uh, it'll bring you over to a Google form that you can fill out, and we will be in touch. All right, so now I will take any questions you have about Guru. And um, if I don't get to your question during this session, uh, you have my email right below at the slide. And uh, feel free to email me at any time at senia at gurulearning.org. OK, great. Thank you, Zinia um, and Hannah. Somebody asked earlier, whose standards do you use for um, creating or embedding the content? Do you align it to the Common Core standards or a specific state standards? Mm -hmm. um, so our math content is aligned to the common core stand standards for mathematics. And right now our science um, content is aligned to California curriculum or California state curriculum standards. Um, and we're working on aligning the rest of our the reigning resources to uh, academic standards as well. But right now it's common core for math and California for science. OK. That's great news. That will definitely be very um, interesting for teachers. And somebody asked about um, the vocabulary section. What keywords go into the to vocabulary? Um, so if you're customizing your own collection, you actually have the option to input. Um, I don't know if anyone recalls when I went to go edit the basic information, there is a field for vocabulary. So you can pick out the vocabulary terms that you think are relevant for that collection. Um, if you're looking at a collection that's pre-made, um, those vocabulary terms will be, have been chosen by the teacher who created that collection. Uh, 
Okay. And the next question was, is this intended for students to create collections or more for a teacher tool uh, for students to find the and access the resources intended for the intended um, by the teacher for students to use? Um, I would say the answer is both. Or both. Um, mm -hmm, definitely both. Um, so we do work more closely with teachers than students. Um, but we definitely encourage students to create collections as well. We've just found that teachers have been quicker to adopt the customization model um, because they like to personalize collections uh, for their students' needs. Um, however, we do have, for example, one teacher that uh, we work with, her name is Elisa, and she is actually a professor at a business school in Singapore. And uh, last year for her, for her speech class's final project, she had her students all 30-something of them um, make a guru collection as their final project. So they did a fair amount of customiza customization and creation on guru um, and then presented their collections on the topic of their choice in front of their class. So that is a really great example of ways that students also customize collections. Um, and then I had mentioned earlier our featured teacher, Paul Allison in the Bronx. He collaborates with his students on collections. Um, so there is a great deal of teacher and student um, collaboration right there. Somebody asked if there's an API for LMS integration. There is. We do have um, APIs. I unfortunately am not the right person to speak to about that. I'm not. Uh, I don't know much about the development side of it. Um, however, you can shoot me an email, and I can connect you um, with our development team, and they can definitely uh, get you started using our REST APIs. What about a widget or some type of way to embed your collection other than a link? Is, is that available? To embed your collection. Um, I'm wondering if the person that asked the question can elaborate on that a little bit as to how uh, they would want to or what they would want to embed their collection into. Well, like on a web page or maybe a wiki or a blog post where um, they could access the like the search box that would call up those specific resources just you know without having to give out a certain link. Oh, okay. Um, actually, if I can bring you all over to the application sharing again, um, I'll give you a look at our search widget, and hopefully this answers the question. Um, we do have a search widget that you can embed on a website, um, and it brings our little search box right over to your website or blog or whatever it is, um, and you can do a guru search right from it. Um, so one of the schools using the search widget on their website is Open International High School, which is here in California, um, and we have really easy script right down here that allows you to install the search widget. Um, so. This is on our website under products and search widget. And so that search widget allows you to access specific collections? Um, that would allow you to do a resource search. So you would only be able to find resources from it at this point. OK, but it, it wouldn't allow you to access just like the teacher's collection that she created? No, no, not at this point. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. if that's something that teachers are interested in seeing developed, also definitely shoot me an email. Uh, um, you know, we love hearing this feedback, and we're a pretty small team, so any feedback I get, I'll bring straight to the team, and we can talk about developing these types of things. So. And somebody asked if Google comes in, or the guru comes in different languages, and if it's translated into different languages. Right now, um, we're strictly in English, but we definitely want to be translated into other languages as well. Uh, we actually do have a fair number of collections in Arabic um, because we work with a, an organization called Partners for Sustainable Development, um, and they've been creating various collections. Um, but any 
collections or resources that are in different languages are actually um, user generated, so by teachers in other countries. So we haven't created our own collections um, with the teachers that we work with in other languages yet, but that's definitely something that we want to move towards as we grow. Okay, and regarding accessibility, how does Guru compare with Google? Um, you know, from a school standpoint, I know that it's often very tricky to do um, or to show resources in schools because of firewall issues um, and et cetera. We haven't had much uh, trouble with Guru in schools because all of the resources that we pull for um, our search are vetted and standards aligned. Um, occasionally, uh, YouTube videos. That, for example, like a Khan Academy video that's uh, searched from YouTube won't play in schools simply because of the firewall um, issue that's blocking YouTube. But there are we have many different resource types, and we source from um, a variety of educational websites. And so there are always workarounds, um, and you can find a similar resource from a different site that is accessible on Google from school. And are there many primary teachers that are using Guru for specific collections? Um, as I said before, right now we are covering 5th through 12th grade content, um, but we are working on expanding our grade levels um, down to the kindergarten level and also up and through um, higher education. So we have a range of teachers who teach different subjects and grades using Guru right now. And because of the customization, um, feature and um, something that I didn't show is that you can actually create a brand new collection from scratch. Um, there are teachers that you know teach English language arts that are using Guru uh, to create collections. For example, Paul Allison is actually one of them. He's an English teacher. Um, and even though we don't have English content in Guru yet, uh, they're able to do that. Okay, I would think you'd be able to create a collection and you know, modify it and make it accessible for whichever grade level you're working with. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the content may be advanced, but you could talk about some of the images and things that you find even with the younger students. Exactly, and so you can remove some uh, resources that you think might be too advanced for some of your students and then upload your own. Um, so those are all ways to kind of work around uh, the personalization. Super. And for students, if you wanted them to be able to build a collection, mm -hmm. uh, would they just need an email account? Yes. Yeah, so, um, and actually, I think I saw this in the chat and I forgot to address it before, but you do not need a Guru account to do a search or um, to study a resource or a collection. But you do need an account to be able to customize and also save your favorite content. So that's where that comes in. So um, if you are a teacher and you customize a collection and you make the collection public and want to share the link with your students, your students can click on the link and study the collection without having um, a username on Guru. But if they wanted to be able to um, customize the collection for their own needs or add their own resources or something, then they would need to sign up for an account. Um, and so if they're over 13, they can do so with just their own email address. Um, and we do verify their birthdays. But if they're under 13, they can use a parent or guardian's email address um, to sign up for an account. Okay, and then using the what we call the Gmail trick with the username and then a plus and then some other word, that type of email account would work as well. Um, I'm not familiar with the Gmail trick. Can you explain that again? The way that we do that is um, like my email account is kk at gmail. But if I wanted, for teachers, you can have up to 25 or 30 um, extra email accounts that filter through your main account. So you put like Gmail plus and then student A and then plus student B. And that would be um, like their full Gmail account. Mm -hmm. And so would that be an issue? Um, I, from what I'm hearing, it should that should work uh, for creating a username. Uh, basically, after you go to Guru and you go through the first steps of the registration process, we'll send you an email, um, and you need to log into your inbox and uh, click on the, a link in the confirmation email in order to be able to finish setting up your account. So as long as the student or maybe the teacher could click on that link in the email okay. for the student, that would work. Okay, that makes sense. And 
some of the schools have Google Apps accounts with students that are under the age of 13. So in that case, it wouldn't be an issue with the age. Um, I don't believe it would be. OK, that's good. Good to know. And somebody asked about the Teacher Square on Air. Can you tell just a bit about that webcast? Teacher Square? Uh, Teacher Square on Air. That's what um, from formative assessment in the cloud video, Teacher Square on Air with education. I actually don't think I. Might be a YouTube video that somebody has just created their own uh, Teacher Square on Air webcast. Okay, I'm actually not uh, familiar with that video recording. Um, but I'm okay. looking in the then chat. Perhaps it wasn't created by um, y'all. It was mm -hmm. somebody else, another teacher, showing how they used the search. Yeah, answer. and I'm looking at the chat, and I did see that Peggy included Jack West's name there. And um, he's a teacher that we work very closely with. So it's very possible that he um, did something with teachers okay. there. Then, then, yeah, then he probably created it. OK, um, those are the questions that I had. Lori, do you have additional ones? Yes, I do. I only have a couple. Uh, the first one is for the four-week course for teachers. Uh, do teachers get a, a certificate for that? Um, I don't believe for the pilot program they do, um, but we are in also in the midst of developing a professional development program, and uh, for mm -hmm. that we will have certificates available. So we will um, share the information about our PD program as soon as that's ready um, on our website. But the pilot program is more focused on um, again, helping a school get through integrated into um, the school district or into teachers' classrooms, teaching teachers how to use Guru. OK, are you taking Canadian teachers in your pilot? I believe we are. And you know what? I believe we actually already are working with a couple of schools in Canada. So definitely, even if you're in Canada, uh, fill out the form. We'll, we will definitely get back to you. And the last one I have, what do you have planned for the future development of Guru? Um, well, as you know, we have a very huge mission, uh, which is to honor the human right to education. and so. Primarily right now, the schools that we work with are located in the United States, um, but we have a big vision to grow the number of resources we have in Guru, um, the number of collections we have in Guru, you know, expand from K, through tw uh, from K through 12 and then K through higher education, and also expand to schools all over the world. So that's our broader vision, and um, we're taking baby steps right now. Um, by first working on our content, so getting English into Guru and also um, different grade levels. But that is um, our bigger picture plan. Mm -hmm. Will it always remain free? Always. Those are the, the ones that I've seen. Yes, as far as questions go. Definitely important that it remain free uh, for educators. Free is wonderful, definitely, Glenn. Are there any questions that we might have missed? Or if you'd like to uh, take the mic, we encourage you to do so. You can continue typing them in the chat or click on the handle. We'll give you the mic if we have overlooked or if you'd like to ask something that um, expands on a question that was previously asked, we invite you to do so. I definitely see so much potential with this, and um, we're always very supportive of safe search engines and providing results that are vetted by educators and, and experts so that our students are not accidentally exposed to um, inappropriate things that maybe a filter didn't catch. And Hannah, would you like to comment or um, share some of your experiences? Sure. Um, I want to say that I actually went through the pilot program, and they were really amazing. They sent uh, Jody and Tim to my school. They worked with us really closely, um, not only in teaching us how to use Guru, but also in helping us figure out ways to do it in the classroom. Um, they actually came in and co-taught one of my classes with me. Um, and they are incredibly responsive. 
when I have had issues or if I've noticed bugs or have made requests, I've gotten very, very fast response times from people where things get fixed pretty much instantly. Um, and they have the right mission. A lot of the educational technology things that I've dealt with have been, because they're so profit driven, will tend to try and find ways to please teachers or find key features to leave out. And Guru never does that at all. Everything is available. Everything is free. They really are there to help us as opposed to helping themselves make money, which is refreshing as a teacher. Definitely. That support is always, you know, just having that, knowing that it's available is a great thing when you're trying a new tool. And about your business model, how are you able to make money, even though you're a nonprofit, but how are you able to sustain uh, your efforts and work in this area? I was actually just typing the answer into the chat box, so I'll go ahead and just say it out loud. Um, so we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, but we're funded by some really um, great uh, foundations, for example, the Gates Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, um, also by Google, by Pearson. Um, by the Ram Sharam Family Foundation, and you can actually view um, all of our funders on our website. So that is how um, that is how our business model works currently. And if a teacher needed support, um, how would they contact Guru? Um, they could email us at support at gurulearning.org. Um, and one of our, either me, actually, or um, one of my other team members will respond. Um, you can also shoot me an email personally, and I will get back to you. So That's great. And I think it's also great that um, teachers can collaborate. And so students, if they created a collection, they could all be added as collaborators as well and collaborate on one collection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so. One thing that last time I talked to Paul Allison, he mentioned was that he was working with a teacher uh, located elsewhere, and they were just they had added each other as collaborators on this one collection, and so they were just whenever they had time, were going into the collection on Guru and iterating off each other's work and providing feedback to each other, and so it almost becomes like a like a Google Doc, you know, where there are multiple people editing and revising each other's work. Um, and you can definitely do that with the Guru collection. And regarding uh, the video content, the video content, are those screened and vetted as well by um Oh definitely. Mm hmm okay. uh, sorry to cut you no, off. No, no, no. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> All of that's, our that's resources great. are um, are vetted uh, by teachers or our content experts, and they are from educational websites. So um, there is no inappropriate content on Guru. And Paul Allison is one of the uh, co-hosts on EdTechTalk.com, one of their weekly teachers teaching teachers. And Peggy has just posted the link to one of the, the sessions where Peggy learned about Guru um, and the search engine. So we encourage you to listen to that podcast for more information and more ideas as well about using uh, Guru in the classroom. Yeah, but just yeah, to add. Peggy made a great point. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that was a really fun um, session, and actually, the I was on it along with my colleagues Tim and Jody, um, who Hannah mentioned because they are actually uh, they work with the pilot program. So, if you want to get a glimpse at them and hear about their work with Guru, definitely check that recording out um, of Teachers Teaching Teachers. Yes, and I definitely agree that this Peggy knew that we had to uh, have you guys on, and I think that. Um, this is going to be a very popular search engine that's going to be shared throughout in the collections. I think that's really um, sweet search is a search engine, but you're not able to make the collections like you can and collaborate with uh, Guru, and I think that's really exciting. And Peggy just posted the link to our live binders with all of our resources. 
And Glenn asked um, if he would be able to pilot this as a tech coordinator, then share it with others. So it's already active and ready to go and able to be implemented, correct? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, we'd love to work. We work with quite a few tech coordinators, actually. Um, a lot of times that's the way that school districts get started using Guru is that their tech coordinators express interest um, in bringing into their school. So um, shoot us an email. We can definitely get you started. Super. And if, um, if something doesn't come up in the, the search and you're creating a collection, you can add personal documents and as well as videos and things that you created yourself to that collection, correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can upload resources um, from a URL or from your computer. For example, a slide um, or presentation that you've made that you want to upload to a collection. You can do that. And are you able, is there a location to search for already created collections? Yeah, so if you'll recall um, when I was showing uh, the search engine part, you can either search for resources or switch it over to collections. Oh, that's um, right. so, okay. Yep. That's great, too. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Somebody's already taking care of that. Mm -hmm. This is fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and close out the show. We're at the top of the hour, but we do invite you to stay on and continue the conversation if you have additional comments or questions you'd like to ask. We want to let you know about the uh, School Leadership Summit that's coming up on March 28th in about, um, you know, about a little over a week or so. And this is going to be a really awesome virtual conference that's going to be, the summit's going to be online, no cost and really great information shared. So we encourage you to explore that when you get a chance. We also want to let you know that Steve Hargadon is going to have some wonderful interview sessions this week. Jay Cross on the 19th, um, March 21st, Adam Bessie, and then this, the School Leadership Thumb Summit is going to be all day on Thursday the 28th. That's um, from the admin 2.0.org kind of uh, group, like teacher.org and classroom, I'm sorry, teacher.2.0 and classroom 2.0. And then also on March 28th, Steve is going to be talking with Michael Fullen, part of the School Leadership Summit. So all of those things, you can find out more information on futureofeducation.com. We want to let you know that next week we're going to be talking about Weebly for student e-portfolios and blogging. Uh, Valerie's going to talk about that. We won't have a show on March 30th due to the Easter holiday weekend, but then we'll resume on April the 6th with Cal Pace, and he's going to talk about ways to use technology in the music education classroom. And then Lisa Dabbs will be with us on the 13th talking about new t teacher community and the new teacher Twitter chat that happens each week. And we won't have a show on the 20th so that everybody can attend the DEN Spring Virtual Conference. So it's going to have some really great information and webinars going on. And then Trisha Fugelstad will be our featured teacher in April 27th. And she is considered a guru of art and art education, and she's a great art teacher extraordinaire. So you'll want to make sure that you mark your calendars for those sessions coming up. And if you'd like to nominate a featured teacher, any educator that works with teachers or students, we encourage you to do so at that link that's shown, as well as the link is always in the live binder that you can access at any time after our sessions conclude. Once you exit today's session, the survey link will open automatically in your browser. And we would love to get your feedback on today's session and the content, as well as future topics for shows that you would like to see us include in our lineup. You can also request a professional development certificate for today. Or if you watch any of our recorded videos in the archives, you can also Use that same link, and that's in the live binder, as well as posted right here. And it's posted in each of the webinars. And you can request a professional development certificate by including your name, your address, your email address. And then Peggy will send those out to you.
We also have an iTunes U channel for the MP3 and MP4 of each of our sessions so that you can re-listen to them or if you miss the live show, you can access those recordings that way. As well as we also have a blog post that we post all this information to. And then you can access using any RSS feed aggregator and access the resources from either show, either way, after each show is posted. And we want to extend a very special thank you to Zinnia and to Hannah for their great information and sharing their examples today, as well as to Steve Hargadon, who is our founder, and Weebly, who hosts our website, and to each of you for the conversation and questions, and to Blackboard so that we can meet each and every week in this forum. So now we're going to hand it back to Zinnia and Hannah. And if you have questions, again, that we haven't missed or something you just thought of, we would encourage you to type those in the chat. Or you can click on the hand, we'll give you the mic, and you can ask them directly um, before we let them go for the day. I think a lot of the things um, are going to maybe come up once we start getting into using and creating the collections. You know, I think this is really exciting. And the email address to contact you is support at support at gurulearning.org, or you can email me directly at xenia at gurulearning.org. And I just want to okay. thank Hannah so much for um, being up so early today and uh, sharing her experience with Guru with us. I really appreciate that, Hannah. Thank you. Great. And I think once we start building the collections and, and um, exactly. sharing that information. Yes, thank you, Hannah. We really appreciate coming from a teacher's uh, point of view you, of having actually used it and implemented it in the classroom. I think that's always a, a great point and giving us ways and also courage to try this out and uh, attempt this with our individual students in our classrooms. And please, what we also have a Digo group. Once you create a collection, we would love for you to share those through our Deagle group. Um, just post that link so that we can see kind of what you have created and what you have shared. And anytime you create something exciting that has to do with our show or you just want to share a tool, we encourage you to do so to, through our Deagle group. And, you know, per, um, share all kinds of things through that DECO group. And are there any questions that we might have missed or that you just thought of and you'd like to ask before we exit out our session? This is the link to our DECO group. We would love for you to join and participate and send links through that. I think it's um, really great that we have access to that as well. And the live binders do a great job as well. So again, thank you so much, Zinnia. Um, I guess I definitely think that uh, our minds are trying to digest this and we just can't wait to dive into things. So we'll go ahead and we'll finish out the session today, but we want to remind everybody to join us next week when we start learning about using Weebly for ePortfolios and blogging and using uh, student accounts with that. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, those who are just finishing spring break, have a great uh, beginning week on Monday. And those who are just starting it, Hope you have a very relaxing week in spring break. So take care, everybody. Have a great weekend. Hope to see you online. And thank you for attending today. Bye-bye.